Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wildlifers. Hope you are all uh, doing fine. Uh, we members of uh, Rotary Fellowship of Wildlifers for Conservation share a common interest, that's wildlife and conservation, willing to work with the 119-year-old organization Rotary towards building a future in which people and nature thrive. To share a few notes about our fellowship group, we are a group of uh, over 650 interested individuals who have globally united around a common interest with a primary purpose to network and further friendship. Our fellowship group got the recognition from Rotary International on 5th uh, January 2021, and hence we hold all our meetings on a fifth day on this virtual platform, uh, irrespective of what day of the week it is. Although our fellowship activities are conducted independently of Rotary International, they are in harmony with the Rotary policies. Our purpose is to create awareness about importance of wildlife, to promote lasting friendships outside one's own club, district and country and to promote locally, regionally and globally that conservation of living resources are very important to humans and future generations to enjoy our natural world and to and the incredible species uh, that live within. Today we have uh, uh, invited members of, of Rotary clubs and friends of Rotary from different parts of uh, the world for this meeting, a hearty and a warm welcome to each one of you. On behalf of wildlifers, I also extend a very warm uh, welcome to our distinguished uh, speaker, Dr. Michelle Singh, uh, who will be introduced by our friend from Barbados, Rotarian Jacqueline Brooms. Uh, mm -hmm. In the meanwhile, uh, uh, Rotarian Maria, over to you. Uh, please, uh, you, can you please introduce Rotarian Jacqueline Brooms? Um, thank you, Rotarian Sanjay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to be here today on behalf of the Trinidad Tobago chapter of the Rotary Fellowship of Wildlifers. We are part of Rotary District 7030, which is um, which includes 17 countries spanning from St. Kitts in the north to the Guyanas on the South American mainland in the south. Um, our our fellowship, we are hoping, as um, Rotarian Sanjay said to do an exchange maybe with by 2025, 2026. And um, we, are great, we are also greatly, deeply grateful to our peers in the global chapter of the Rotary Fellowship of Wildlifers for Conservation for granting the spotlight to one of our gems in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago in today's presentation. I am especially delighted to introduce you to fellow wildlife member from Barbados, Ms. Jacqueline Brooms, in just a moment, Jacqueline would have the honor of presenting our keynote speaker, who is also a member of the Wildlifers from Barbados. And um, Jacqueline is a professionally trained agronomist and currently serves as the sustainability manager at Mount Gay Distilleries Limited, the world-renowned distillery established in 1703. Her exceptional leadership is transforming a once underperforming sugarcane estate into a model of regenerative agriculture, setting a standard for sustainability in the, in the industry. With a Bachelor of Science in General Agriculture and a Master of Philosophy in Crop Science from the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus in Trinidad, Jacqueline's academic excellence is as clear as her professional dedication. Not one to rest on her, her laurels, she's currently expanding her expertise as a PhD candidate delving into the rich diversity of sweet potato cultivars in Barbados. Jacqueline's commitment to service extends far beyond her professional endeavors. She's, bec she's since becoming a proud member of the Rotary Club of Barbados South in May 2021. She has quickly ascended to leadership roles, including director of membership, and is currently serving as a director of youth for this Rotary year. A tireless efforts earned her dis the distinguished title of Rotarian of the Year in 2022. One, when not engaged in many commitments, Jacqueline enjoys the companionships of her pets, 
exploring cul culinary delights and embracing the vibrant rhythms of Trinidad soca music. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Miss Jacqueline Brooms. Thank you. Good morning and good evening, fellow Rotarians, guests, and friends. It is indeed my pleasure to be here with you and to introduce Dr. Michelle Singh, who is our guest speaker. Dr. Michelle Singh is a passionate Caribbean scientist with a driving focus on developing regional food security and sovereignty and promoting social and economic empowerment of the Caribbean people. Dr. Singh maintains a consistent focus on implementing strategic climate smart advancements through collaborations in education, research, and entrepreneurship. Creative utilization of novel technologies and the identification of opportunities for significant impacts are central to these strategies. Dr. Singh holds a PhD in livestock science from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, where her thesis focused on the agouti, Dasiprocta leporina. She's a well-published scientist and actively participates in regional and international conferences. As the director of the Center for Agricultural Research and Innovation at the University of the West Indies Capeville campus, Barbados, Dr. Singh is charged with agricultural knowledge translation for business development. Her broad skill set gives her the cutting edge spanning both the domestic and non-domestic livestock sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Michelle Singh. Good morning, and thank you very much for that introduction. I would like to thank Rotary uh, Wildlife Global for asking me to be a presenter here today. And I'd like to begin sharing my screen so we can start with the presentation today. Okay. So why, why should we speak about non-domestic species and their value and importance and think of a paradigm shift? The Caribbean is constantly faced with the increasing cost of grain on the international market. And we have seen a decrease in the exportation of food from developed countries to developing countries. This means that we have the perfect opportunity to investigate and explore our native flora and fauna for food. As many of you would know, the Caribbean is a net importer of food from outside of the region. However, our native plant and livestock species remain underexplored and are not fully investigated. However, these species are very well adapted to our environmental conditions of the tropics and are well adapted to climate change. Many of you may be asking, what do we refer to when we refer to the New World Tropics or as some call it the Neotropics? Is that part of the world that spans from Central America all the way down to South America or just on the border of Argentina? Which means that we are a biodiversity hotspot holding about 70% of the world's biodiversity. This area accounts for more than 502 species of reptiles, 604 species of birds, and the numbers are exorbitantly high for mammals and amphibians. Some of the work you will see here today speaks about the biodiversity of Trinidad, where we have just under 1.5 million people, and we are considered a biodiversity hotspot of the Caribbean given our proximity to the South American continent. Trinidad boasts about 95 mammalian species, 85 reptile species, 30 amphibians, and 54 species of freshwater fish, some of which have even remained undocumented to date. The current situation in Trinidad, wildlife is harvested through hunting, and persons hunt for recreation, they hunt as a business to generate income to support their homes and their families, but also wild meat is a cultural food preference for many rural communities. Our hunting is controlled by legislation, but we do suffer from very high levels of poaching during the closed hunting season. This means that we have had to seek alternative methods for supplying wild meat to the growing demands of our population. 
This data is a bit dated. It was done during, it was collected during my thesis because all hunters are mandated by law to supply a hunter return card, which lists the number of any particular species that has been harvested and their sex and their geographical location. From this data, you can see that the agouti or daisy proctor leporina is one of the most highly caught animals which means it's the most consumed mammalian species in Trinidad. And that led me to my research on the agouti. However, there are a number of other non-domestic species that are of great economic importance and have potential for further research and development. Pomicia or the Black River conch, Cascadura or Hiplo, Hoplosternum littorale or armored catfish are all considered delicacies in Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, some areas in South America. The spectacled caiman, the meat is much sought after as a delicacy as well. And tupinambus is harvested for its skin to be converted to leather. Of course, now these are my babies. These are the mammalian species that we have been working on as a means of conservation through production. Agouti, the red brocadier, Mazama Americana, peccaries, the labas, the green iguana, porcupine, the nine barded armadillo, and the black eared opossum. All are harvested from the wild with the exception of the porcupine, which is now considered a protected species, but all have the opportunity for further investigation and further attention to develop production systems. Capybara, guinea pigs are no strangers to South America and the red tail boa, though a protected species, is much sought after for its skin for making uh, belts and handbags. The purpose of my presentation is really to broaden our appreciation for wildlife in terms of its utilization. Many persons who keep wildlife as pets or in zoos or personal farms do so for educational purposes, to conduct research as a form of recreation, as a form of conservation. But for some, it's also as a means of food production. I would like to explore with you some of the utilization through food production, which targets the Im improvement of the green economies of these small island developing states in the Caribbean, as well as Latin America. But in order to do so, we have to have an appreciation, and this is my livestock science hat on, when we say we have to understand what makes the animal grow in captivity, what makes the animal reproduce, so we have to consider the basic factors affecting livestock production, and those would be housing and the environment. How do we keep the animal? What special considerations need to be made for animals that are rodents, for animals that are herbivores? In terms of feeding and nutrition, are we able to maintain the animals in captivity? Can we ensure that they are satisfied that they meet their nutritional requirements, which they would usually meet on their own in the wild? Do we have an understanding of their reproductive physiology, their reproductive behavior, and their reproductive needs? Because if, especially if you are working with protected animals, wildlife farming or ranching can be a conservation technique. However, it means there needs to be a full appreciation of the genetics and breeding of that species. When we bring non-domestic species closer together, we run the risk of an increase in disease problems, which means we must understand their health and what factors affect their health in captivity. And sometimes you have to take knowledge gained from domestic animal production and transfer it to the non-domestic animals to better understand it in a faster way. And then we have the socioeconomic factors. What would make a farmer expand? How much can he expand? The zoning laws, the legislation that binds him, 
we really need an understanding of the socioeconomic factors. And all of this is tied in to the physiological states, because if we cannot marry physiological states with any of the factors affecting livestock production, then we would have not done ourselves justice. I'd like to share with you some of the information that has been gleaned because in Trinidad and Tobago through the University of the West Indies Faculty of Food and Agriculture, we have embarked on a series of initiatives to better understand those species that are of economic importance, the most hunted species, the most harvested species. This is the agouti, there's the Procter leporina. And I've shared with you here some of the information that we have developed through a number of years under the direction of Professor Garcia at the, at the faculty. We have an understanding of the animal's diet. The animal is a frugivore, but it's an, it's an opportunistic carnivore. We understand that we need to supply each animal in a breeding colony with about 50 grams dry matter of feed per day. Because the animal is a rodent and it burrows, we have developed concrete floors with, um, with clay blocks up to a particular height to prevent the animal from burrowing and escaping. For those farmers who do not have access to sufficient funds to develop this type of infrastructure, we have undertaken an initiative to train them on how to build wire cages and the dimensions of these wire cages per breeding unit. The animal is a rodent, which means that its, its incisors grow continuously. So we had a couple instances where it grew so much that it punctured the upper and lower jaw. So we had to introduce wood for the animal to gnaw on so that it controls the growth of its incisors. Again, it's a rodent. So we had to introduce metal cups, else the animal would bite through. Through our investigations and research, we've identified seven different colors of the agouti. And uh, we have tried to keep all of these colors in captivity and develop pure lines with, with some success. We have identified a male to female breeding ratio in captivity of one male for five females. But in an instance where there are a limited number of males, you can even increase it to 10 females. The gestation period for the agouti is about three months and it can give you two to three young. We have had instances of up to six young per litter. Another animal that has received some attention in Trinidad and Tobago and Brazil, and I know we have some Brazilian um, colleagues on this Zoom today, packer or lap farming is also big business because it is one of the most hunted species in Latin America. Again, I have applied the factors that affect livestock production and transposed it onto an understanding of how we keep these animals in captivity. We feed them up to 80 grams of dry matter per day. They kept similar to a guti in breeding colonies. And in this model, you see a combination of wire and dirt floors, but they have cast a, a foundation of about six inches to prevent the animal from burrowing out under. Again, you have to provide wood for them to gnaw so that they don't, so that they control the growth of their teeth. You have to use a lot of metal infrastructure. We have identified two colors, the brown and a golden color. In captivity, the animals can be kept at a one male to five to 10 female. The gestation period is similar to the aguti, but a little bit longer and they give birth to one to two young per litter. Sorry, they should read capybara, not lava. So in capybara farming, there, are, there has been the expansion of capybara farms, particularly in South America, where it is much sought after for its skin, very useful in the leather industry. We understand the animals are hind gut fermenters, so they have the ability of converting loaf quality forages and properly utilizing that as opposed to domestic livestock species that have a very high reliance on commercially produced wheat and grain. All of the animals that I've highlighted to you here today can 
survive on locally available feedstuffs, which means that the animal is well adapted. It also means that people have the opportunity to reduce their cost of production, making this, this type of farming a very lucrative business. The capybara can grow up to about 100 pounds. We've seen two colors so far. We have a male to female ratio of about one to 15, and these can be grown in a semi-intensive ranch type system. And they give four to five young per litter. We have actually seen larger litters in captivity because uh, the access to food is not the limiting factor in terms of litter size. If we were to look and explore wildlife utilization and look at the agroecotourism agro opportunity, it impacts the green and orange economies of our countries. And I've highlighted a few examples that can be followed in Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean, Latin America. Ever alligator farming in the Everglades, Florida is what we know as experiential tourism. And I heard many people on the chat before I started the presentation speaking about coming to, to touch the lions and, and the domesticated lions and all of that. That is a very, very, very important part of wildlife utilization where people gain a better understanding of wildlife species that have been bastardized, that have been, most people are afraid of them. And it starts pretty young. I would, I always encourage school visits and school tours because the young kids have the opportunity to interact with otherwise bush animals, wildlife, and have a better understanding and appreciation for conservation strategies going forward. So in Florida, that experiential tourism gives you an opportunity to see the alligator eggs hatching, hold the hatchlings, take part in tasting the meat and purchasing alligator skin products. In Asia, snake farming is also an ecotourism attraction where persons are again exposed to the hatching every single physiological stage of the animal. And most people are afraid of snakes. So this type of farming exposes people to the experience to reduce that, 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 that drive to kill a snake when you see it. In St. Martin, we have the experience of butterfly farming, and this has proven to be very, very important in some islands of the Caribbean, particularly when we talk about regenerative agriculture and pollination for fruit-bearing trees that we have seen reduced over the years because of an excessive use of harmful chemicals and pesticides. And of course, my favorite part of utilization, food, or ethno cuisine, which is part of the green and the orange economy. This data published in 2008 shows a comparison of the protein and fat content of many consumed wildlife species. And I've put there the, the names that they're called in Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, most people would know the scientific names, but when we compare their protein content to domestic chicken that most people consume, you see that wild meat or non-domestic species from tropical forests are higher in protein and lower in fat, which means that they're healthier for you. So they have the opportunity to be marketed as such. Now we're gonna explore a little bit of the culinary delights from wildlife. This is a peccary roast that we had a, a chance to sample in South America. And this animal can be fabricated similar to how we would fabricate the domestic pig. So except that it does not have that thick layer of fat that is so common in pig meat or pork. In Peru, guinea pig farming and guinea pig production is very, very important. And we have actually seen guinea pigs grow up to five pounds and it's included in their diets. It's included in their restaurants. In fact, you cannot visit some South American countries and not taste guinea pig because it is sold as street food in Peru. It's part of the native people's access to indigenous foods. 
This is the spectacle came on, and these are my photos from a, a hotel in, this was Bolivia, where they had alligator meat or caiman meat on the menu, giving value to wildlife. South America doesn't have ostriches, but we do have the rear, and rear meat is also on the table. In fact, in Argentina, you can choose your cut from the, from the fresh carcass in, on a table. We talked about the ecotourism and export opportunity. Value-added products from wildlife. Cayman leather is one of the most beautiful leathers on the market. And it has a very high value, particularly because it is so soft and pliable and can easily be shaped and transformed into high-end products like wallets and shoes as compared to cowskin leather that, I, that is primarily used for furniture and handbags. Rear feathers are also produced from the rear farms in Argentina and they sold internationally, particularly during the carnival seasons for the production of costumes during the carnivals. Here you see an example of peccary leather and caiman leather in Bolivia, all value added products from utilizing our native wildlife species. The armadillo shell converted into musical instruments and sold as ethnic products enable communities to get the most value from the animals that they live closest to. So in conclusion, I told you I will not take very long. Non-domestic species have the potential to become a protein source in the neotropics or the new world tropics, reducing our meat importation and strengthening food sovereignty. I got this photo off of the internet and it says, sorry here. Oh, sorry. I'm just trying to move this box. It says a game crop is a community asset. Wildlife can be farmed to increase production and reduce the hunting pressure. And it also provides a commercial opportunity for value added products once managed properly. That brings me to the end of my presentation and I thank you very much and the floor is open for questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Michel. Um, you have uh, given us a completely new perspective of uh, how wildlife is treated in that part of the uh, you know globe. Uh, in fact, uh, yesterday I I was attending a, a premiere of a, of a film or a documentary uh, made on uh, tiger conservation, and uh, I saw a couple of conservationists saying that you know um, breeding of uh, tigers or production of tigers in China saw only uh, a very uh, negligible increase in its numbers compared to, you know, uh, non-intervention uh, uh, breeding uh, or, you know, allowing wild to be wild in India. Uh, in India, the tigers multi multiplied by uh, three to four times in the last uh, 20 years uh, because there was no intervention. Uh, your talk was something... Uh, you know, different from what I saw yesterday. Uh, so uh, our idea is to really hear uh, different perspectives. Uh, ultimately, we are all looking at conservation of wildlife because for us, biodiversity is important. So uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing your uh, uh, thoughts. Um, I will leave the floor open to questions. Um, I think there is a question on the chat box by yes. uh, Gitanjali Dar. Uh, she says, is it ethically sound to consider non-domestic wildlife as property or commodities subject to human control and manipulation when these animals possess their own autonomy and natural rights? How do we justify our dominance over their lives and habitats. 
That's 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 a very, very good question, and it has been raised before. My response to that is that it happens naturally. We destroy their habitats for housing, we destroy their habitats for population expansion, which means we are already manipulating their habitats. And I would hate to think that we risk losing certain species or any species for that matter due to habitat destruction or pollution. So my perspective is that it does not necessarily have to be for food production. Those are value added benefits. But my advocation is that farming those animals or breeding them in captivity gives the animal an opportunity to survive in an, in an artificial environment just for the preservation of a species so that we are not subject to this habitat loss and loss of, of, of key species. I Thank hope you. that answers, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else, you can raise your hand if you have any other question. Uh, meanwhile, I have one question. Um, so, if you are producing wildlife, mm -hmm. How does it make it different from domestic? This is something very fundamental. Uh, I know yes. uh, to ask, yeah. but yeah, how does it make yeah. it different from domestic? Because I'm sure that whatever domestic animals, what we have today, most most of the domestic animals, what we have today were once wild. How does it still continue yes. to be wild? All of the animals we eat today were once wild. All. All right. So it depends on, so the last animal to be domesticated by my knowledge is the rabbit. Okay, so domestication takes place over a series of centuries. It's, it's a very, very long process where we have that animal conform to certain behavioral traits, certain reproductive traits, certain diets, responses to that. And the thing is, we use the word captive bred over wild. If we keep the agouti in pens and you come as a consumer to purchase the meat, for me, our farm, we will not say we are selling you wild meat. We will say we are selling you captive rare wildlife. So the choice is yours, whether or not you wish to purchase it. But in terms of calling it wildlife, it is simply because it is not considered a domesticated species. So we only have about five or six of those cattle, sheep, goat, pigs, chickens. All right. And those five domestic species rule the world. Yeah. If you if you go to Guyana and you walk the streets of their markets, you will see wild meat for sale, primarily because they've harvested it from the wild. Those that are captive red are also sold as wild meat because of the status of the animal in that country. Does that answer? Yeah? Yes, yes. Does that yes, help? Yes. yes. I see um, Jacqueline Brooms has a question. Have the consumers been accepting the non-domestic meats in Trinidad? Barbadians are less adventurous and would need exposure for a change in mindset. Trinidad consumes a lot of wild meat per capita, okay? In fact, two out of five persons in Trinidad, two out of five households would purchase wild meat. So it is in high demand. It is a very um, cultural food, particularly during festivals and that sort of thing. And yes, I know Barbadians are less adventurous and would need a mind change, but the biodiversity of Barbados has changed because of the monoculture of sugarcane. And so they have not been exposed to as much biodiversity as Trinidad. Their main challenge in Barbados is the green monkey, which has become a pest. And I would consider it an agricultural pest. So yes, yes, Jacqueline, we would have a lot of work to do in Barbados to change the mindset. Sanjay, I see people have raised their hands. Yeah. Uh, Rotarian Ganga, uh, yeah, you raised your hands first. Uh, kindly ask your question. Thank you, uh, Piti Sanjay. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Lipis, lovely presentation. 
Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. All right. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. It was a lovely presentation with all this uh, statistics. But my question is, when you are bringing this so-called wild animal into captivity and uh, and uh, you know you're rearing them for social social economic benefits, like you say, the leather is very in demand, meat is in demand, all this thing. What percentage of this species are given back to wildlife? to live in their own style, in their natural environment. You yes. bring them, you tame them, you change their habit of living right from the, you know, not to make a burrow and you feed them what you want to feed them, not what they want to eat. All this, you are changing the entire system of their life, right? Now, what percentage of these animals are given back to forest? Why I'm asking, all over the globe, we are, we are, stop, uh, we are, we are against poaching of animals, and we want this rare species to multiply, and uh, it has to live for our generation to see, for, uh, for their, uh, to get their benefit. Now, uh, it's uh, concentrated on socio-economic benefits. Are you getting my point? What is that person that you are giving back to the wildlife? That's right. Uh, I, I guess I didn't point. do it. Thank you. I did. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't do myself justice in making some points. My point is that wildlife farming is an opportunity for conservation and also production. <laughs> somebody's mic. Yeah. Please, can you hear me clearly now? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, 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 please go ahead. Yes. So I would like to address a couple of the points that you raised. One is that we bring them out of their natural habitat into an artificial environment and we feed them what we want to feed them. That is not the case. When we bring the animals, there is an acclimatization period. There's an entire process. And we feed those animals food that is harvested from the wild. So we do not change their diet per se. The other thing is that we encourage the wildlife farmers to reduce the human interaction as much as possible so that they retain their wild instincts. And five to 15% of their population has to be released into the wild every year. That is one of the guidelines that we have advised. So it's not all for socioeconomic benefit. Remember, we are keeping these animals in captivity to reduce that hunting pressure. So if we focus the, the population's attention on purchasing the meat from a wildlife farm, it gives our wild populations a chance to regenerate themselves. But we are also supporting that reforestation and reintroduction through allowing farmers to release these animals back into the wild, from especially those that have not had that large um, human interaction. Yeah. There yeah. was another hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, next one is by Steve. Yeah. Steve, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Good morning. And thank you, Michelle, for your presentation. I just wanted to make a few points. When we are talking about development, development is always people focused. And I keep hearing inferences to choice of diet and so. Our, and in some cases, the indigenous populations, their diets were changed by the influence of Europeans and others who encourage them to eat other forms of meat. So without getting into the whole vegetarian um, carnivore debate, I'm saying that these were species that were, as part of a food sovereignty claim, you have claims on those, on those, those um, animals to start with. The other aspect is that, and I know my agronomist friend, Ms. Brooms will agree with me, very, often we ignore the input of livestock farming in the production of the vegetables and fruits that vegetarians are so keen about. 
with climate smart agriculture, with a more resilient agriculture, we are going to need animal passage to really get the types of nutrient recycling that you need for strong vegetable production. So I'm suggesting that even if you are not a carnivore, even if you are vegan, you have to appreciate that we need these animals around. We need them to complete our nutrient recycling. We need them to be part of the biodiversity that we are so proud of. And I'm saying that increased emphasis must be placed on livestock production, whether it be domesticated animals or as in the case so strongly made today for the neotropical species. Because the kind of burden we have put ourselves under to try to feed animals that have been imported into our environment is going to be easily offset by having animals that can be fed with local forage, et cetera. So I just wanted to make that little point there. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, uh, Kiran, please go ahead. Rotarian Kiran? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have two questions to make. I mean, since uh, this entire project, you said that it is to reduce the uh, consumption of wildlife. Is there any study uh, uh, saying that after introducing this method, is there any reduction in the hunting number A? Number B, for study's sake, uh, any study has been done that whatever the protein values you have given, uh, as compared to uh, one which is in the wild? Yeah. So the answer to that question is no, because I completed this work in 2019 and I have moved on to another um, institution. But that is an excellent point and one which should be followed up on because Trinidad alone has more than 500 registered wildlife farmers because you must register with the government in order to be a wildlife farmer, all right? So it would be very, very interesting to understand the impact of wildlife farming on wild populations and protein consumption from these wildlife farms. However, what, we, what I didn't mention is that wildlife farming is married to our hunting legislation. We are only allowed to hunt from October to March of any year, which means we have five months of hunting Wildlife farmers can only sell their meat during those five months of the year as well. So it limits them to a very small window to generate income. I am aware that the government of Trinidad is reviewing some of these legislations to make it a little bit more uh, lucrative to reduce that hunting pressure. So I can follow up on that question. And, and the number two, the nutrient value, what you mentioned in the reared wildlife, and yes. the actual wildlife, any comparison has been done? Yes, actually there is very little change in nutrient value because as I said, we try to maintain the diet as close to mimic what is in the wild. What we have noticed though is that the animals in captivity um, grow faster, of course, because they have food ad lib as compared to the wild where they have to forage. So we are seeing an increase in weight faster in captive red systems. Thank you. No problem. We have uh, some more uh, comments and questions in the chat box. There's one question. Uh, the name of the um, Name is not written. It only says iPhone. Yes. We'd be interested to know what cultures have evolved through education, religion here, which try to avoid this. Do you feel this is a useful idea for their protection? I try not to dabble with religion at all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> But we do have a very large Muslim contingent in Trinidad. In fact, we have Hindus, we have Muslims, we have Christians. Our Minister of Agriculture is a Muslim. He's an avid hunter as well. Education-wise, we have the Caribbean is governed by the Caribbean Examinations Council, 
which is our overarching body for education at the two secondary and tertiary secondary level in the Caribbean. And I'm very happy to say that non-domestic wildlife production has been included in the syllabus. So we have education at the secondary level and also at the tertiary level. It is a useful idea for protection because once we add value, and I don't mean value only for economic value, I mean value as in education, people are made more aware. It is definitely an, a useful area for uh, a useful idea for their protection. Um, thank you. Um, there is a question uh, from Mr. Vikram Udaigiri. Is flavor and texture of domestic game same as wild game? Right. So I, I spoke a little bit about that already, but I can tell you that some people have indicated that they can detect differences in flavor from captive red over wild caught. But that has only been anecdotal evidence. We have not um, conducted the studies to, to determine that at a scientific level. So I cannot answer that. I am a consumer of wild meat and I eat either one of them. I can't tell the difference. All right. But I can tell you because we have access to, to captive red animals, I don't go in the bush that much. So my dogs are getting fat because I don't run anymore. Right. Uh, the uh, Rotarian Prabodhini says, I really like this initiative. This is creating win-win situation where human needs are provided and they don't interfere in the ecosystem. Uh, then again, iPhone says uh, there is definitely a strong cultural requirement for non-domestic wildlife production here. Uh, but Geetanjali Dar says, in my opinion, concentrating on conservation efforts within the natural habitats of these animals supports uh, their survival without the necessary necessity of captive breeding. This may involve initiatives aimed at preventing poaching, preserving their habitats, and creating wildlife corridors. And this should be the focus wherever wildlife meat consumption takes place. I agree. I agree. But sometimes it's out of our control. Trinidad is an island. We only have limited space. <clears throat> Anyone else have any other question? Um, iPhone, okay, it's a direct message. I'll read it. Yeah. Vijaya said, listen to a new perspective. Thank you for arranging the talk. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, we are done with the questions. Uh, very interesting uh, subject. And uh, you gave us a new perspective. Um, Conservation through production is something that we had uh, never thought of. In India, definitely, we have a very strict uh, Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, there's no hunting. Uh, in fact, I, I want to tell something at this point in time. When I applied for uh, the fellowship recognition, uh, wildlife fellowship recognition, RI said there is a hunting fellowship also, uh, which has made an application for recognition. So they wanted us to be very specific, whether we are uh, wildlife hunters or wildlife uh, conservationists. So I said, we are wildlife conservationists. We are not talking about hunting. But um, you have given us a new perspective to the whole thing. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a good food for thought. Uh, for all of yes. us to think. Uh, it, it, it is a revolutionary change in the way we think of conservation. It it also depends on uh, where we are. Like you said, you have a you know, a shortage of space. Um, may not be an uh, ideal thing to do in India. That's, of course, that's my view. Uh, 
what we have, uh, the stringent laws that we have to protect wildlife, or what we say, you know, um, our absence is more important for wildlife to thrive uh, than our presence is what the method that we we are adopting here. So maybe different countries have different uh, needs. I, I, have, I have a few questions, if I may, Sanjay. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I want to. I am sure there are a couple of more. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure there are uh, better conservationists or uh, uh, better wildlifers than me. I'm not a conservationist, sorry, uh, who will be able to answer your question. But anyway, I'll try to. Let me see. Yes. I'm, I'm happy to be in this with such an esteemed group. Because my questions have always been, what is the rate of habitat loss for your wildlife? What is the rate of production in the wild of your most um, protected species? Um, what is the rate of wildlife habitat loss? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm given to understand that we have only uh, we have only about four percent of our uh, only four percent of our country has uh, uh, protection in the form of uh, national parks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's considerably uh, very less area that is protected, um, mm -hmm. or uh, the the habitat uh, is very less. Four percent is very less. I think something around 10%, at least 10% uh, of forest cover is a better uh, uh, thing for our wildlife to thrive. This is what I have heard from different conservationists. Uh, yeah. So the other question uh, is, uh, so, sorry. What, what has, has, does anyone have the data on the rate of population growth of your wildlife species? What is the rate of growth for your elephant species? Um, Rate of growth for lions, your large mammals. Yeah, it's it's all available. It's all available. I I may not be able to share offhand, but it's all available. Yeah. So, for me, that 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 justifies our interaction and our intervention, because if we are seeing a decrease in habitat and a reduction in populations, which means we have reduced population growth of wildlife species, it means slowly but surely. We are losing our animals. We are losing our biodiversity. And are we going to wait till it reaches a critical point where we have less than 10 animals of any particular species to start supporting reproduction and captivity for wild release? Um, see, we have, uh, I can I can give the uh, the. Uh, uh, one of the keystone species uh, is, um, you know, tiger. Tiger is considered as, uh, yeah, Gitanjali, please go ahead and answer. Yes, you are, a, yes. you, are, you are a better person to answer this. Gitanjali? Oh, she said she's in a crowded place. She cannot respond. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Tiger population estimates to 3,925 with an annual growth rate of 6.1%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem, Gitanjali. This is a, a, in fact, I wanted to give you the example of tiger itself. Um, we had, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we lost most of our uh, tigers to poaching um, until the, you know, Wildlife Protection Act came and um, the, the government, uh, 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 put its uh, foot down and said, no, we have to uh, come out with the, you know, protected areas uh, for these animals. And um, uh, we had probably about uh, 1,400 and uh, ti 411 tigers uh, about 10 years, 10, 15 years ago. I think now we have nearly about 3,000. Uh, 900. That's uh, uh, th this is what I was uh, trying to say. Whereas uh, on the contrary, in China, they are trying to grow tri tigers and uh, the rate of growth is very less compared to uh, what we have seen here. Uh, it's it's negligible. They, the number of wild tigers they have in China today is only about 80, whereas we have nearly about 3,900. So as, as compared to, to, to 50 years ago? 
No, no. As compared, no. Now the the there are pro protection laws in place. Earlier there were uh, so most of the tigers were lost uh, during the British rule, British Raj, um, because uh, uh, it was we lost it for hunting. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a new document documentary that is made, uh, Project Tiger. Um, I saw it. Yeah, it, it just, it was released, it was launched yesterday. I would okay. uh, like you to uh, see, once it is released, I'm, I I will definitely share the link. I would like you to see that, yeah. Yes, so we speak about the large mammals, but those animals have been the subjects of poaching. Tell me about those wildlife that are consumed in India. What is the most consumed? What is the most utilized? Okay, um, we are not supposed to kill or consume wildlife. Uh, it is prohibited. But uh, illegally, um, if you ask me, my my uh, within my knowledge, I can say if you in terms of mammals, I I think it's the wild boar, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, consumed the most, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Deers also in some parts, but wild boar meat is uh, the most uh, sought after. Uh, uh, and, but it is protected by law. It is still yes, protected. It is, protect it is still protected by law. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the word and, I uh, like. Uh, some of the uh, rural areas, you know, some of the village villages, uh, there are people who uh, kill these birds. Uh, some of the birds like the um uh, gray francolin is what we call uh, those birds are hunted um there are people you know uh, still hunting on some insects um and feeding on them uh, but yeah. of course very uh, uh, it's it's not so open it's not it's not open right so you just made the point I'm pretty sure that your rural communities have a higher dependence on the forest than your urban centers. I'm sorry, R rural communities? Have a higher dependence on the forest than your urban centers. Yeah, obviously. Um, yeah. We have, we have lost all forest development here. Yeah, exactly. So that 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 generally has been the motivation. We, I I, I mean I do, I can't see us reaching a critical level to develop an intervention strategy, you know. And and the word food sovereignty is more important than food security. That cultural dependence on native foods, it doesn't have to be wildlife. It could be your beans. It could be your seeds. But it is that ability to choose the food that you wish to eat based on culture absolutely absolutely we have a particular tribe in uh, gujarat uh, there's this uh, place called gir gir forest is where uh, our asiatic lions are located that's the only place in the uh, in india where you can see the asiatic lions or that's the only place in the world where you can see asiatic lions we still have a particular tribal community living inside the forest uh, um, but they don't, they are all, uh, uh, I think if I'm correct, they are called the Maldari tribes. Um, uh, they have their own cattle. They are all vegetarians. Surprisingly, none of them eat uh, meat. So they are dependent on the uh, dairy. Mostly they have cattle. They they take the their cattle uh, into the forest for grazing and they milk the cows and they sell it outside. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, culturally also, I think uh, um, there is a lot of support for conservation uh, uh, in India uh, as against um, as against uh, 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 hunting uh, or killing an animal for wild meat. Yeah. So the, one of the uniqueness, unique things of the new world tropics is that wild meat is considered indigenous food yes 
So even though we have protection laws, there is the argument that native peoples have a right to native foods. Yeah, as opposed to introduced species where we have to import the grain and the feed to feed our livestock, our native species consume what we grow right here. That's, that's just the argument, one of the arguments that supports it. Yeah. There is, I rightly said, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, there is uh, in, indigenous people still, you know, um, many of them depend on, though uh, there is a, there is a bar, uh, still they depend on, on uh, bushmeat. Uh, there are people, uh, if you go up north, northeast, north, northeastern part of India, I am told that, uh, you know, hunting happens uh, regularly. Uh, so because, because they prefer to support the, their families. They have to support their families. Yeah. 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 All right. It was nice uh, interacting with you. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving your uh, inputs uh, on conservation. Uh, conservation for uh, product, uh, so production for conservation is absolutely yeah. new to us. A, a, a nice uh, perspective for the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much for having. Thank you, uh, Rotarian Maria, for giving us this wonderful speaker. So we will come back with our next session on uh, uh, the next month, fifth. Um, so. Uh, Please uh, do uh, uh, log in. I, we will share the uh, details of our next meeting. Um, so Subir says, 